It's a pleasure to be back here again at LSC. Um, as you probably know, I've just written in my next book, Start Your Own Business in Seven Days. And what I thought I'd do is I'd take this opportunity today to share with you a little bit about my experience on what inspired me to write the book. The concept of Start Your Own Business in Seven Days was really inspired by my experience at Dragon's Den, where I met nearly a thousand crazy people who had some of the most incredible ideas that you could ever imagine. And then during the, the, the period of Dragon's Den, I launched a website uh, called jamesandbox.com, which attracted nearly a million people who approached me with you know, even more crazy ideas. And then recently, I launched an app which is called James Khan's Business Secrets that's had nearly 150,000 downloads of people inspired to look at business ideas. and just taking that wealth of activity and experience, it's given me the opportunity to understand what are the things that make successful entrepreneurs become successful. And what I've done in the book is really taking you through that journey of the things that actually work, the things that don't work, but what are some of the characteristics that I look for when I'm backing people? So what I thought I'd do today is rather than really focusing heavily on technicals or the book, but actually give you an example to see some of the people that I've actually backed and introduce you to real life entrepreneurs so you can gauge what is it that makes me back a particular individual, what are the qualities that makes that person successful. And my theme this evening is very much based around not success with a business as an idea, but success actually in business is about the individual. And the one common characteristic that I've met through the entire journey of Dragon's Den and meeting those thousand people is generally speaking, each one of those individuals happen to believe that success lies in their idea. What I'm gonna share with you today is actually, it's not the idea that succeeds, but it's the individual. So really what I want you to focus on today is to understand what are those qualities, what are those characteristics that when combined together make something really successful. In my analysis, I tend to focus that the idea represents 10% of success. The execution plan of that idea is 45%, and the individual's passion and drive is the other 45%. And those combination is what makes it successful. So let me just take you through the specific individuals that I'm going to introduce you today. So firstly, what I'd like to do is ask Spike Hughes, Debbie Smith, and Faisal Buck to join the stage. So let me give you a reason what made me pick these particular individuals. So firstly, Spike Hughes um, on the left, who looks like the chap in Dragon's Den that I replaced. What was his name? Um, <laughs> the guy with the quiff. Farley. Richard Farley. That's Richard Farley lookalike. Um, when I met Spike, Spike approached me with a business idea where he wanted to set up a business in the financial services sector. What I tended to focus on when I met Spike was here was somebody who had over 10 years experience within the financial services industry, who'd successfully raised over five billion pounds through the market to invest directly into funds. The key challenge for me was here was a guy who was prepared to risk his own capital, be in an industry that he absolutely knew and understood, the risk for me was could this guy run a business, which he hadn't done before, because working for somebody else, whilst it gives you amazing experience, but does it allow you the expertise to run your own business and take your own risks? Next panellist is Faisal Butt. Faisal was somebody I met who had approached Hamilton Bradshaw with the view that he wanted to build a career in private equity and be an investment manager. Within a very short period of time, I realised that actually Faisal has, bless you, um, the characteristics of running his own business, very driven, very motivated, and very passionate about his own business. Debbie Smith was somebody who approached me with an idea who wanted to run a recruitment business in the social services space. Here was a lady who'd actually been there, done it before, worked for somebody, 
built a business from scratch of over 50 million in revenues, a highly profitable business, and felt that she had reached a point in her career where she was now ready to embark on her own business, was prepared to risk her own capital, work seven days a week, and put herself in a position where failure was not an option. So three very good individuals. But the reason why they're here today is because what I wanted to share with you is every great idea and every great business generally has immense execution risk. Just because you think the idea is good doesn't mean it's going to work. In Spike's particular situation, the minute Spike launched his business, we experienced the worst financial crisis the Spike has ever experienced in his career. All of a sudden, the market that he was about to embark on literally collapsed. Nobody was interested in investing in financial products. In Debbie's case, she already established the business, got the business up and running, literally within a three-year period, got the business to 20 million pound turnover and realized that the government had imposed more aggressive cuts in the public sector than she'd ever experienced before. Her market literally fell out of bed, the margins in her sector literally got squeezed, and all of a sudden she found herself in a position that she could never have imagined when embarking on her business. Faisal had experienced a situation where joining Hamilton Bradshaw didn't actually have an idea as to what business am I going to invest. So like a lot of people in the room, I think I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm very driven, I'm very motivated, but what am I going to do? So Faisal finds himself in a situation with the correct circumstances, but doesn't actually have a business that he wants to launch. So collectively, we need to find a business that's going to suit Faisal. I think they, to me, represent the reality of entrepreneurship. This is not about the get-rich-quick scheme, but what I'm going to share with you is some of the challenges that people face. So from your perspective, Spike, if you can just share a little bit with the audience some of the challenges that you face that although the business plan looked great, the numbers look incredibly impressive, but what happened when the ink dried on the shareholders agreement? Yeah, well, you, you, your, your cheque was obviously cashed. Clearly. <laughs> and, uh, probably 24 hours before the market collapsed. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that was good timing. We've, we've had lots of challenges. You know, trying to, trying to hire good people is very challenging. Um, Lots of people are good in big companies and they come into a startup company and the environment's very different. You haven't got lots of resource around, you, ha you haven't got lots of people to help you. Uh, and um, you know, when you hire people, you have to say to them, you're giving up all the security that you've got for the nine to five hours and you have to come and work in a much longer, tougher environment. And, and, and you know, when you get it wrong, you just have to go back to the drawing board and, and hire people again. Uh, we had. Um, uh, we had challenges uh, with, with our distribution strategy. So, you know, when you come to the market, you have to have a product which you have to test. You have to have a strategy or dis you know, a, a distribution strategy in terms of how you're going to sell it. And um, we actually did a deal with the ninth largest company in the world. So you know, when I first saw James, he said, who's going to sell it? And I said, oh, I'll come back to you. And a few weeks later, I came back and said, I've actually got a contract from a company four times the size of Microsoft that's prepared to, to JV with us. So, and, and, and so I thought, you know, that was like getting the shelf space from Tesco's. But that particular company went through immense change. Again, within hours of us starting that deal, um, they restructured their whole business three times over the two-year period. So again, we had to look beyond that. We had to change our pricing model. We had to find new distributors. Uh, we, we, we launched products that were very, very much in vogue in a, in a bull market, but in a credit crunch, suddenly, you know, we, we were taking... Uh, building products in the emerging market region in China and India and other emerging economies. Now, uh, I, I can place a pretty safe bet over the next 20 years, you'll make a lot more money in those countries than you will in developed markets like the UK and Europe, which we read about, you know, which is where all the problems are. But of course, when there's a panic in global markets, people in the UK that you're selling to don't want to invest outside the UK, even if the UK and Europe are causing all the problems. So suddenly we had to look at changing our products, finding new ways of selling them. Um, if you're not selling them, <coughs> James say you start off with a business plan. If the business plan is uh, you're going to make sell so many so much product every year and make so much money, you suddenly find out when the market collapses that you're not selling anything or you're selling very little, uh, which means you're burning twice as much cash as you originally thought. So you know, that's quite a painful thing because all the things you thought you were going to be spending your money on, you suddenly can't anymore. You sit down with James and he says you've got to halve your cost base, and and then you need to work out how you're going to do that, which means you're taking a salary cut. Your key people are taking a salary cut, and a number of th the things that are nice to have you can no longer do. 
So it's about continually adapting to the changes, I think. What do you think, Spike, in, in having experienced that journey, mm -hmm. what you originally thought that the journey of an entrepreneur would be, which was the theory in the bright lights versus reality, what do you think are the key things that have enabled you to stay sane during that period? What's the, what, what are the options of failure for you? Yeah, well, the first thing I did was, uh, before setting up, I had a nice job and had been fairly successful for a few years, made good money, and I gave all of that up. I sold my house, I had a nice motor yacht, I sold that, I had nice cars, I sold that, I cashed in all my savings, and uh, essentially took everything I had in, in property and toys and savings and put the whole lot into the company. I then persuaded all my friends to do the same. Uh, they, weren't all selling their they, they weren't all selling their houses, but they were all investing a, a fairly significant you know, part of their wealth into the business. I persuaded James, and so the option for me on failing is, is, is one that you can't really, because um, it means you've got nothing left. And there probably aren't that many places in the world I could hide where my friends and investors collectively couldn't find me. But you know, James said two things to me on day one, both of which were right, both of which were quite annoying at the time, actually. Uh, the first one was, um, you'll, you know, turned up this beautifully presented business plan and he said, nothing in there that's going to happen in reality, you know, your experience will be very, very different and he, and he was completely right. Um, and, and the second thing, I can remember it was the, the 9th of December 2008 uh, uh, that you said this when you came in and saw the team when we first set up. James said, if it can go wrong, it normally does. And everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. Um, I think the, uh, the secret is, is that you need to surround yourself with experienced people, uh, people that have done it in different guises before. And you don't need lots of people around you, but if you've got really successful entrepreneurial people around you, they can give you lots of supply, uh, uh, advice and support. And, you know, I think you, you have to be honest in these situations as well. And most times that I go and see James, I'm explaining why what I said last month hasn't happened, and you know, how are we going to do it differently and bringing another problem. And, you know, James has always given me the, the support and the confidence and the strategic way of thinking through problems. Uh, you, know, you don't need to get from A to Z in one go, let's get from A to D first and then we'll worry about how we get to the next stage later. And I think you know, everyone needs one or two people that they can draw that energy from and that, that kind of coolness and belief, uh, which I've had from James and you know, other people get from, from people that they surround themselves with. Thank you. Okay, Faisal, you joined essentially, in theory, into a corporate environment, not sure. an entrepreneurial environment. So how did you identify it? Because there's a lot of people out there who are thinking, I'd love to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know, you know, what's the next cat size? What's that next business idea? <coughs> Talk us through your journey. How did you identify the idea that you think now that, that kind of positioned you to become an entrepreneur? I think m my story was a little bit different that, uh, to Debbie and Spike in that I came into a corporate and it was a place at that time, Hamilton Bradshaw, about two and a half years ago, it was a place that was rife with opportunity, but we weren't exploiting all the opportunity that we had coming into us. Um, it was a place where we were largely looking at one sector in terms of entrepreneurs to back in the human capital sectors, but we were getting opportunities from other sectors as well. And for me, I just started to think, James knows and I know I'm not really here to work um, as, a, as, as an employed person, but we're look, we would like to work together and start businesses together. And what I started to pay attention to were business plans that were coming in and teams that I was meeting from um, one of the sectors that was quite interesting at the time, which was real estate. And this is post Lehman's, um, obviously a lot of people had uh, there was quite a bit of churn in that market. People had moved on. And what I started to, uh, to, to see was that there were talented people, very talented people, in fact, and talented teams that had come out of the big real estate companies um, and had the benefit of hindsight. They knew what had went wrong in the industry. They knew where the opportunities lay. And they were backable teams, and we weren't looking at them. So I just saw that as an opportunity as somebody within HP and grabbed onto the opportunity and really cr turned that into a business plan that I presented to James. We had a number of Sunday sessions together just going through it and walking through how it, it would work, how many entrepreneurs or teams we would back over a five-year period. And I kind of got the same response from James that Spike did, where you know this all looks nice, but it's on paper and it's very academic and it's theoretical. Um, show me that this is real. And what I went out and did was 
I found a team of two that we would pilot the concept with. And it was that pilot that made the business plan all the more real. It was the assumptions that we, I mean, a business plan really is a collection of assumptions. But when you do a pilot at the same time that you're building out your five-year plan, that begins to make it all the more real. Um, and this one business that we backed together has ended up being a very successful business within five years of inception, uh, five, five months of inception, it feels like five years. And, um, <laughs> but actually, the, the reason why I probably slipped and said five years is because it is on, on the brink of doing potentially the largest deal within the HB Group's um, history. So really it was all down to backing the right people and, and really thinking about investing from a human capital perspective. Who's the team? What's the yin and yang between the founders? Do they fit in, um, fit in well together? What's the complementarity in, in terms of skill sets? And um, really it was, it, was, it was about finding the right team and now the entire kind of five year plan is based on finding these teams um, and helping to grow and scale their businesses. And tell me, Fraser, so when you bring a business plan, you know, how do you feel when the first question I say is, it's so good, are you putting money in this deal? I know that I need to think through it very thoroughly before <laughs> I take anything um, to James, which is why the model actually works so well. With This is a model that James um, has kind of introduced into the way we invest in startups, where the guys bringing the business plan to the table need to put some, need to, need, to, need to invest in the business. Me being the one evaluating it and running HB Real Estate, which is the venture capital house that's backing property entrepreneurs, needs to put capital into it. And that only then will James look at it. And that de-risks it. So I think in many ways when people talk about entrepreneurship being about taking calculated risks, it's about de-risking and managing risk. And I think it's these types of um, techniques that help you manage risk. Fantastic, thank you, Faisal. And Debbie, you're in a very interesting business that actually took off and, and, and started amazingly well. Fantastic growth, attracted the right people, got the market, got the business up and running, made a million pound profit. Mm -hmm. It was all going really well and you thought you were it's still going well, by the way. <laughs> Steady. Um, but all of a sudden, you found yourself in a position that you've probably never been before, where actually the market completely went against you. Mm. Just, just maybe talk us through a little bit about that experience, because here's a classic situation. On paper, it all looked great. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? So it did look good on paper, and I think you even said to me, James, correct me if I'm wrong, that after the first two years, I've never seen someone's business plan so accurately. Mm -hmm. I'll take that. But then the market <laughs> yeah. shifted, um, and it really did shift in terms of within the recruitment sector, uh, we were actually a candidate short market and a very candidate-led market. Social workers in the UK is a, is a needed profession. Um, and that was really kind of most of our efforts went into that side of the business. So when the public sector cuts kicked in, um, it suddenly became about the client, and the client became king. It was a very job short market and we'd actually aligned the business to a candidate short market. So suddenly we had quite a big gap where we didn't have the existing established relationships with clients. Um, that was absolutely paramount to future success. So for me, it was about having a very strong team. I think we can all talk about the investment in human capital. Um, without the individuals that I brought on board from day one, I don't think we would have been able to evolve as quickly as we have been. Um, and I think it's about them feeling that it's as much their business as my business. Um, so from day one, uh, the four senior managers that I brought with me or started the business with, they weren't friends that I asked to invest, but they were colleagues, very esteemed colleagues that I'd worked with for sort of a very long period of time. Um, and for me, it was about de-risking the proposition. Um, it was about ensuring that I was only going to sort of make the gamble when I knew the odds were on my side or on the business's side, because for me, if the business failed, it wasn't just my money I was going to lose, it was the money of these individuals who I'd built very long-standing relationships with. So um, because of the team and the calibre of the team, we started with 10 people on day one, including the four managers, we were able to very quickly align our strategies, evolve the business model, what we were offering our clients, our candidates, and ensure that we're able to continue our growth trend. 
Um, and I think there was definitely some sort of downtime where we didn't grow, but we just sort of held our position. Um, but very quickly, we were able to sort of realign <coughs> strategies in order that we could kind of achieve growth, which is now coming through, thankfully. What's, um, what's your forecast for this year? This is year four. This is year four. So the forecast is approximately 23 million turnover. Um, it will be 4.5, uh, sorry, 3.5 million GP and 1.2 million EBIT. And what, what would you say, Debbie, just as an entrepreneur, somebody that this is your first venture that you've started out to, you know, when you're looking at that proposition, if people out there are thinking, you know, am I ready to start my own business? What advice would you say is, you know, what, what do you think have been the key characteristics that have enabled you to achieve that? Um, I think I'm quite different to some entrepreneurs in that I'm quite risk averse and I'm a bit sort of, I don't like to take too much of a gamble. So for me, I took quite a different uh, route, which was seven years working for a, a competitor in the market, for a successful competitor, um, built up my knowledge. It was almost like a training ground. And then once I knew I had kind of the skill set, having worked my way right through to the top and had, having dealt with kind of a number of problems, scenarios, making mistakes along the way, um, I think at that point, you know, I knew I was ready to start my own business. Um, and I think... Um, How much did you invest yourself personally? £100,000. And what would have happened if, you, if it had failed? Not an option. Not an option. Um, I have a huge fear of failure as an individual. I don't have a problem admitting that. Um, you know, I don't... I, I'm very risk-averse. And I think, for me, it was about sort of making sure that the odds were on my side when we started the business. And I think, for me, the other option, the other thing to consider was that I had four managers who in invested their life savings as well. So if this business didn't work and it wasn't the right strategy and business plan, I would lose their life savings as well as my own. So for me, you know, we had to make sure that it was a robust plan, that we were able to evolve it quickly and make changes quickly. Um, but ultimately it was that we ticked all the boxes and we, we removed and mitigated as much risk as possible. So I think what you'll see there, ladies and gentlemen, is I suppose if you put yourself in my position, what makes me decide to invest in a particular plan or an individual? The common characteristics, I suppose, with Spike and Debbie is these are two people who have a proven track record where they can demonstrably show me that this plan is going to work. They've done it before, they've tried and tested. So I think from your perspective, that is a very important takeaway message, that when you're about to embark on something, rather than just pioneering an idea, having the knowledge and the expertise and understanding the execution risk is critical. So clearly for me, that was fundamental and crucial. Secondly, for me, it is really important. So let's just pick a number. If I'm going to, if a business plan wants a half a million pounds investment, let's say I'm going to put up 400,000 and Debbie's going to put up 100,000 pounds. The problem that I've got is, without being arrogant, if I lost the 400,000, it wouldn't change my life. The problem is, but it would change Deborah's life. So for me, I need to know that the risk-reward element is correctly balanced because ultimately she, as the entrepreneur, is going to run that business. And I need to know that in the event that business doesn't perform, she will experience the same pain as I would. So that for me was absolutely crucial that she and I were completely aligned. Thirdly, I then need to look at the individual and recognise for her how much passion and drive would this woman work seven days a week? Probably. Would she work in that business even if she wasn't going to be paid because the business didn't perform? Absolutely would do. So I think what I'm looking for, and I think from your perspective, when you're sitting there thinking, am I ready to be an entrepreneur? The key question is, are you prepared to make the sacrifices that are necessary? I think what you'll do is through the book, you will see that the way I've kind of described the concept of the journey in seven days <laughs> In a way, I was imagining going down a journey on a train and saying, in that journey, there will be a number of obstacles that you will come across where I will challenge you through the book to establish whether are you ready. And at each part of the journey, when you get to the next stop, I say, if you haven't passed test day, you have to get off the train and leave the station because you're not ready. And the idea being, if you get to the end of the journey, and you've passed all the relevant tests, then you are definitely ready and prepared to begin your journey as an entrepreneur. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, introduction. Uh,
um, time for uh, Q and A. So this is your chance to ask the questions and get the secrets of these uh, very successful entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, two things. Um, if I give you the floor, uh, please state your name first. Um, please be short in your question as well. And we try to keep the lectures uh, during the day at the LDP. Uh, so who would like to uh, ask a question? There's a question actually at the back. The mic is coming to you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Gaurav and I've got a question for James. At LSE, we talk about type 1 and type 2 errors in terms of rejecting people that maybe we shouldn't have in hindsight. And I'm wondering, in your long career of backing people, how often do you make these tiny mistakes that uh, lead you to not picking someone who ends up doing quite well? So let me just understand the question. So, 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 so have you ever, um, let's say, seen someone and not been sufficiently impressed by them, but they've gone on to do quite well? And Absolutely you... never. <laughs> Was there anything else? <laughs> Type two. That's it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on rather swiftly. <laughs> Next. Yeah, hi. Uh, I also have a uh, question to James. My name is Shui. Like all the three examples, you know, the fantastic people you showed us, like, they all got their work experience, you know, before they switched to entrepreneurs. Like, you know, as a, like, I'm a, a student, you know, without much experience. If I want to be an entrepreneur, what suggestions do you have for me? Thanks. Um, I think what I'm trying to, uh, and I picked these three individuals very specifically for that reason when I was coming to LSE, because I wanted to demonstrate that being an entrepreneur is not a race, it's a journey. If I give you an example, the chap who started McDonald's was 63 years old and built probably the world's most successful food business. The chap who started KFC was 74. So, you know, the message I'm giving you, you're a student today, it's not a race. What really concerns me more than anything else is people who start too early, who are ill-equipped, who don't have the experience, the understanding and the confidence. What I'm saying by illustrating three individuals to you is actually what you should do is gain some practical experience of the idea that you want to execute. Because doing it cold, from nothing, with no experience, to me is the highest risk. You know, when somebody asks the question, you know, how many people do I back who make it or don't make it, I probably have one of the highest success rates in the industry. That's not because actually I think I'm very good at what I do, it's because I think I manage risk better because I probably won't back somebody who doesn't have those kind of scars of experience because I know that even three incredibly talented people will make an incredible amount of mistakes. But actually what I need to do is have that cushion of knowledge and experience that they have something to fall back on. But if you're a student and you're just coming fresh into the market, to me you would be the highest risk from an investment perspective. Now that's not to say you won't make it, but if you're sitting where I'm sitting, you're there with capital that you want to invest and you want to judge and analyze the risk the best you can. And to me, if you have a business plan and you have five to seven years experience with a track record that says, I can do that and I've done it before, who would I back, the student or somebody who's got the proven track record? So I think my message is that whatever your passion and idea is, you need to embark on that journey and gain some realistic experience of that before you actually embark on your own business. <coughs> yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Ricky Katari. Um, it's really to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm going through this journey like uh, many of you are as well, and especially people in the room. Do you get those um, the kind of days where you know you feel slightly the, the energy levels drop slightly? Uh, I'm only saying that because I've actually pitched to Hamilton Bradshaw Venture Partners with a gap analysis tool a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and it was really about understanding in that pitching situation, how, do you, how have you felt and your experiences of that? Faith? Um. 
good, good thing I was listening. <laughs> it's a good dodge, James. <laughs> so it's, it's, you're asking about the recipient of the pitch as opposed to the person pitching? Because I, I, I'm in a situation where I have people pitching to me um, every day. And I think the way my energy levels stay high is because I'm kind of feeding off of the energy of these entrepreneurs. I mean, all, th there are days where I'll just schedule my day all day long meeting entrepreneur after entrepreneur after entrepreneur. And you can just imagine the energy levels that um, I, I'm just uh, ex experiencing all day long. So I mean, how do I keep my energy levels up? It's because I'm surrounded by it and I feel it myself. It's, it's, and it's, it's also, HB is a place where there are startups and joint ventures all around us. So there really is a lot of energy in that environment. And we've created that environment because we incubate many of the companies and teams that we back there. So it's, it's hard not to have that energy because you're surrounded by it, really. I think I have it on my own, but... Um, <laughs> even but, if he says so himself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, even, even if there's a down day like the one that you were experiencing, I think that all the energy around me, is, it's infectious. Let me ask you, uh, the way, we have quite a number of uh, students here from the LFC. Uh, you've emphasized the importance of experience. And you said, get some experience first. So what should someone graduating from the LFC in May do? What is the sort of experience they should get <laughs> to uh, prepare for a career as entrepreneur? What advice would you give them? You or any of, the, of course, the audience. Oh, sorry, the panel. I mean, I, I suppose if it was me, when, when you look at my own background, so I'm not just using other people as an example, but I went through exactly the same journey myself. My passion was recruitment. So before I set up my own recruitment company, surprise, surprise, what did you think I did beforehand? You know, I ran a recruitment business. So, you know, I went and, and gained that experience, worked for somebody else, understood the business, understood the issues, understood the challenges, because otherwise, how do I find the confidence of risking my own capital? So when Deborah put in £100,000, it was because she'd done it before and she felt confident. When I launched Alexander Man, which was my first recruitment company, I had the confidence because I'd worked for somebody else and I knew what the risks and the pitfalls were. Now, if I hadn't done that, would I really be sitting here today? Probably not. So I think that the message for me is, if you have a passion in a particular segment or a market or something that you feel very strong about, I absolutely believe before you, you take that risk, you should get a job in that space because to me, the thing that concerns me the most is if you do it too early and you fail, you will look in the mirror and say, I'm not an entrepreneur. And we may have just missed out on probably somebody who could be remarkably successful. So I don't want you to risk that situation too early in the game. Be patient, gain a little bit of confidence and experience and then embark on the journey because you will then have the substance behind you because when something goes wrong, you're better prepared in knowing how to deal with it. If you go cold and it goes wrong, the chances are you will throw the towel in and the world could have missed the next James Cunn. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, another thing to add to that is um, you get into a place to get the experience and then you'll surround surrounded by people that are very experienced and they know what they're doing. But the thing that is really, really amazing out there is the quality of people in the workplace, in, in, in uh, industry and business, in any industry, I think is pretty poor in most cases. So if you've got that extra bit of energy, that extra bit of drive, that extra bit of passion, you hang out with the people that are the most successful people there, you really annoy them by asking them questions all day long, trying to find out how to do things and do things better, and, and, and you work hard you can be, just do an extra 10% more than you think, and you can be standing out head and shoulders above everyone else. And that's what creates the opportunity. One, one thing I'd just add to that is that a lot of people look at their career in a very kind of linear fashion. I'm either going to get a job or I'll go out and start my own business. But I think that it can get a lot more interesting than that. I mean, my, my story is kind of one of an entrepreneur where I joined a corporate but we both kind of knew that it was going to be more than that. And we, when we found the opportunity, I spun out and uh, formed a new business in partnership with my employer. So and there's creative ways in which you can kind of reconfigure your relationship with somebody you're employed with. So it's not really just one path or the other. It's not black and white. We haven't had a question from a lady yet. And because my daughter graduated from LSE, I always believed that women were very passionate at LSE. So where are they? There's actually one at the back. So oh, okay. 
I just didn't want to go home this evening without getting a question from a female entrepreneur. Hi, my name is Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie. For James. Very nice to see you, Natalie. Um, I'm just wondering, what expectations do you usually have from a pilot scheme? What expectation do I have from... A pilot scheme. So A pilot, a pilot scheme? That's a great question for you, Debbie. <laughs> confused on that front. No dodge this time, James, I'm sorry. Um, I think from a pilot scheme, um, well, we've just done one recently, as Faisal mentioned to you. To us, I suppose, a pilot scheme is absolutely critical because generally what happens, if the pilot doesn't work, your enthusiasm on the idea completely wanes because you set such high expectations when you try something so I think expectations on a pilot are absolutely critical. I think what we tend to do is we're quite experienced now that when we look at an idea as a pilot, my objective is to see if I can make the pilot fail on paper. And I think the one lesson that I've probably learned over the last 30 years, which for me is the most valuable lesson, is if you're going to be an entrepreneur, the first advice that I would ever give anybody is you have to understand how to fail. Because I think everything in life, everything in education, avoids that issue. And for some reason, we dodge it, you know, we don't want to accept it, we don't debate it, because we're all so hyped. But I would say, without a question of doubt, if you said to me, if there was a lesson that I've learned, without a question of doubt, it is the ability and art on how to fail. Because once you can understand and accept that everything you're about to do will have an element of failure, and you understand how to manage that failure, you will be able to fight to live another day. The problem is when people don't understand the principles of failure, what happens is you do actually fail. So there's nothing in my career that I haven't done that I could classify as failing. So have I backed an entrepreneur who didn't make it? Yes. Have I bought a business that absolutely collapsed where I lost all my money? Yes. Every category of failure that you can identify I will put my hand up and say, I've been there, done that before. Now, the question is, because I understand it and I accept it, I can continue to believe in the future. So I think, that, to answer your question, the concept of the pilot is absolutely critical, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you have failed, it means the idea has failed. And one way you can avoid that is to test the idea on paper. So whenever we're about to do something, I literally go into that pilot concept in so much detail because I'm trying to anticipate what could go wrong. Because to me, the book, Start Your Own Business in Seven Days, the primary function of that book was, you know, I looked at the UK last year, there were 350,000 businesses that failed last year. I believe that 80% of those businesses I could have demonstrated could fail on paper. Now, if I can show you a plan that doesn't work on paper, I have saved you a fortune, and also I've retained your confidence and belief that you will have another go. So the key message for me is any idea, it is possible that you can experiment so much with that idea on paper, because if it can fail, to me, you've succeeded. Maybe ask uh, Faisal as well, because you talked about uh, the pilot question. Sure. So what advice uh, would you have uh, about how to do the pilot? Sure. Uh, what are the sort of assumptions that you test for the pilot? What advice do you have for people who know they need to do a pilot, but how to use it? I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a no-brainer, but I think that you need to take a sample transaction all the way from start to finish and walk through every step of it. Um, and then just ask yourself the question as the entrepreneur, do I have the skill set to do that one bit of it? I mean, you can, I mean we're sitting, sitting in, a, in an academic environment, so I can get a little bit academic about this. I would just take your transaction from start to finish, flowchart it out, and just ask yourself, am I the best person to be able to do that step? Am I the <coughs> best person to be able to do that step? And I think that whole exercise, while it sounds <coughs> academic, will very quickly tell you um, whether you have the right team in place. And most likely, you're going to need to strengthen your team and find a partner that complements you. OK. Um, question at the back. Yeah, very back, behind you. Uh, there, there. Hi, um, my name is Patrick. I'm an LSE student. Um, I was wondering if you can walk us more in detail um, through the dis uh, decision-making process that you make when you make an investment. And also, I would like to know more about the ability to fail successfully. 
that was interesting. Sorry, what was the last point of your question? Just like, can you walk us through our, uh, your decision making process when you make an investment in more detail? Okay. So, um, typically what happens is somebody will, so let's use a live example. So Debbie approaches me with a business plan. So we initially look at the plan and say, does the plan actually make any sense? Do I agree with the market? Is this a sector that I believe is growing? Do I think there is a sustainable growth opportunity? So we will tend to do a reasonable amount of due diligence on the sector. If the sector doesn't work and the opportunity, you kill it there and then. Assuming I like the sector and the dynamics of the sector make sense, I then move on to the entrepreneur and say, is this a backable individual? I tend personally to spend more time on the second part than I do on the first part. So then look at the individual and say, what would make this person succeed? What is she putting to the table? What risk is she prepared to take? What would happen to her if this plan didn't work? What are the key drivers in this plan that makes the plan successful? In Debbie's case, it was absolutely driven by one major component, which was she was, had an assumption that she would identify 10 people at launch. Now, generally, that's a little bit overambitious, where anyone starting a business that says, I'm going to recruit 10 top people you know, in my first quarter, to me, the first thought that goes in my head is, which planet is she orbiting at the moment? <laughs> and, you know, because it's not easy. So I would challenge that and say, Debbie, that's a really interesting observation. Can you give me the list of the 10 people who you think you're going to hire? So I'm being really specific, not will you hire them, but can I actually have the names of the people? Because if you haven't thought it through to that level of detail, you're probably not backable. So I would challenge a whole series of situations in that plan. And normally, for me to get to my conclusion, I will probably ask that individual to test a number of those assumptions to prove to me that they've actually thought them through. Because as you know, you can create any business plan that you want. If you can apply the right assumptions, you can make the plan do whatever you want it to do. From my perspective, if I'm going to put investment in there, I need to challenge those assumptions to see how well have you thought them through. If you cannot demonstrate that those assumptions are credible, realistic, and you understand them, the chances are we probably wouldn't make the assumptions, or wouldn't certainly make the investment. No. Uh, the lady over there, the rods. Oh, another lady. Yes. Hi, my name is Dr. Miller Marineva. Um, I'm doctor. actually, yes, I'm a junior doctor at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and an ex um, LSE alumnus. Um, I have a question for you, seeing as you talk so much about gaining experience in the sector that you want to obviously become an entrepreneur in. Um, for those of us who are in that sector and have gained the relevant experience, how do we go about taking that leap and, you know, um, possibly? cutting off a secure job to actually become an entrepreneur and how, you know, what kind of advice would you give to, to us? Um, and the second part of my question, which I think is going to be slightly more relevant to the majority of people here, um, is regarding having those fantastic ideas and how do you take those great ideas and pilot them and put them out there um, when so many of us, I guess, are scared of people sort of catching on to the idea and, you know, borrowing it and using it in some, some kind of other way, shape or form? Okay, really good question. Okay, let me firstly kill the, the one common myth, which is when somebody has an idea, in generally, as you quite rightly said, they're scared, but if I go and tell somebody, they're going to copy it. If I had an idea that I thought was amazing, I thought was the next big cat size, I would do the complete opposite to what you said, which is I would go and tell everybody. Because what I would be trying to do is I would want to know why is the idea going to fail? Now, I don't have the patent on knowledge, so I would go and talk to as many people as I can, but what I wouldn't be saying is what do you think of this great idea? Because just because the way you frame the idea, you're almost anticipating the response. I think it's incredible, you'll do really well. Whereas I'm going to say, listen, I've had this idea, I'm not sure if it's going to work. What do you think? I'm acting because I'm going to learn more from somebody that can find something wrong with it than somebody who tells me it's great, go ahead and do it, because I learn nothing. So first, I'm not afraid if they copy the idea. And the reason why I'm not afraid because if it's that easy to copy, it's not a great idea. 
you know, so to me, I'm not actually, because if you honestly think that the quality of your idea is such that within 10 minutes of a conversation, somebody can go ahead and implement that idea more successfully than yours, I don't believe it could be that great. Because if I go back to my beginning point, it is not the idea that succeeds, it is the individual. Businesses do not flourish on their own. They need the passion, the drive, the commitment, the determination of the individual. It is the individual who breathes life into the idea. So just by telling somebody else, I don't believe somebody else will ever have the passion that you will have. So because of that, in 30 years of my life, I have never been afraid to share that idea with anybody. And if somebody does, and to this day, nobody has ever literally gone out and copied the idea, now, maybe the message in there is because all the ideas I come up with was shit anyway. So, <laughs> so maybe there's the answer. No. So I think, A, personally, I'm not going to be paranoid. I'm not a great believer of the kind of whole patent structure. So, you know, a lot of people go out there, get an idea, and think, great, let me get it patented, let me go and spend a fortune, etc. Do I really believe in that? No, I don't. And simply because until I'm proven the idea to work, I'm not going to waste my money. Because if you go to one patent lawyer and you get it registered, I will guarantee you, you go to another patent lawyer and said, if I wanted to get round that patent, what would I need to do? And do you know what? It takes the guy 10 minutes to work out that if you change the fabric, if you change this design, or if you, there's a little quirk here, it gets round the patent. So what do I really achieve? So only until I've actually tried and tested would I even bother patenting it, because I'm going to waste my money. I think the key thing for me is if you have an idea that you believe in, number one, if you're not prepared to take that risk, you're never going to do it anyway. So at some point, you have to get to that position. The only way I believe you will get to that position is you get the idea, you put a plan together, you create a business plan, and then you test the assumptions. You know, and, and I suppose, to me, the best piece of advice I can give you, the only assumption to me that really and truly matters is will somebody buy this that I don't know? Not my friends or my family or my brother or my sister, but if I went to the open market, is this a product or service that somebody independently is ready and willing to pay for? Because I'll give you a really sort of very quick example of, of a friend of mine who approached me with a great business idea. And I think this is quite typical of some entrepreneurs. So here's a guy, he actually knows me very well, he's been a social friend of mine for many years, and he approached me and said, James, I really feel embarrassed because you know I know you get this all the time, but I actually have an idea, I want to pitch you. I think, okay, well you can join the queue with the other thousand, but I'll give you 20 minutes, let's have the pitch. Anyway, so he's bought this, um, what is it, embroidery machine, and he's come up with this idea that he wants to go to people who have normal clothes, like you've got a regular jacket, and he wants to embroider logos and motifs on your existing garments. So, you know, I had a, a kind of a dinner jacket that had the velvet thing, and just put a bit of velvet, not, was it like kind of purple stitching, that just made it a bit unique. Anyway, so what do you think of the idea? I said, you know what, actually, I can see there must be people out there who've got clothes that they don't wear anymore, but you can jazz them up a bit. It's not very expensive. I think you should go ahead and do it. So, uh, and he said, great. So I said, what I suggest you do, make half a dozen samples and take them to a few shops. Anyway, I meet the guy three months later, and I said, oh, by the way, how's the idea? He said, I made the six samples that you said, but then I realised that actually if I took only men's wear, they might say, what about women's wear? So I'm currently working on the ladies' wear section. I said, well, I'm not sure I would do that, because I could frankly just do visuals of, of ladies' wear. But he said, no, 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 I want to physically do the ladies' wear. Okay, off he goes. Three months later, he's now built you know, a kind of ladies' wear range. I meet him again, I said, how's the plan going? Have you met any suppliers? Haven't done that yet, because I'm just, just working on my website right now. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not sure you really need that. You can have a holding page. What I need to do is you should go and talk to suppliers. Anyway, no, no, I've got to have a site, because if I show them the stuff and they go to my site, it doesn't exist, I'm going to look Mickey. Okay, go ahead and do the site. So he's now working on the site. See him three months later, how's it going? He said, the site's looking fantastic. I uh, haven't spoken to a customer yet because we've got a photo shoot coming up next week because I've got some models coming in. I've got to get the right pictures, you know, because if they look at my site and my pictures aren't great. So, okay, I've got to do that. Okay, three months go by, we've got a photo shoot, we've got models, all that sort of stuff. The, the site's looking fantastic. Have you spoken to a customer yet? Not yet because I thought when I take my samples out, I need proper suit carriers, you know, with my logo on there because I can't just walk in. 
Okay, so now we're waiting for this supplier to come from Italy with the suit carriers, with the logos and all the rest of it. Anyway, another three months go by. Have you seen a customer yet? No, I've just realized that I want logos on my buttons because I want to have my branding and my logo on the buttons because this is going to be a bespoke garment. Anyway, eventually I see him three months later. I said, have you seen a customer yet? He said, I haven't seen a customer. I've run out of money now. I'm calling it. <laughs> now, absolute true story because the moral of the story is so many entrepreneurs, to me, go too far down the product range. If it was me, I'm not exaggerating, I would have produced three samples and literally got on the road and start knocking on doors. I, on every other point he raised, I would have created visuals to, to use as, as a way of demonstrating the product. So if I want to show personalised buttons, I don't need to make them. If I want suit carriers, I can design them you know, on Photoshop. If I want to create a women's wear range, I can do that. But every entrepreneur I meet, they, are, they want to do everything other than talk to the customer. For some reason, the customer is the biggest fear. To me, I would start there, talk to the customer first, because if he says, I'm prepared to buy it, bingo, the chances are the customer will say, it's a great idea, but, and that's the but I want to hear. It's too expensive, it's too bright, it's too whatever it is, because that's how you evolve and test the idea. Use the customer to help you gauge your, your proposition, because if the customer says yes, that is the best evidence that you will have that your plan is ready to succeed. We'll ask at the end again and we'll see how many people are there. But what I would like to ask you, let's go to the core of what was the key question in your mind that you're having or had when considering to start your business or not? This is your chance actually to get free advice yeah, from the most experienced people in business. Normally you have to stand in a queue for a thousand people. Now you can be out of the queue and ask a question. Yeah, uh, the guy in the red shirt. Can you hear me from I can hear you, absolutely. Eric, the yeah. mic is coming. My name is uh, Eric, and uh, the question I had before was what sort of experience... Thank you very much. My name is Eric, and my question I thought initially was what sort of experience should I get before I set up my own business? And you have sort of answered that. But another question which I had was, is it useful to work with somebody else's startup before you set up your own? Thank you. About time you took a question, Debbie, please. Well, that's exactly what I did. Um, so I started a social work recruitment business. I was the first employee in the social work market. Um, so there were only two of us on day one. And um, I think for me that was vital in the journey to where I am today because I saw that business from a very small business right through to the market leader. We had, at the time that I left, as, as uh, James said, it was a 50 million turnover company. There were 65 staff just recru recruiting into the UK social work recruitment market. And um, that business went through some serious growing pains along the way. Uh, mistakes were made. I was part of that. Um, you know, I progressed through that quite organically through the growth of the business. And I think what that's given me is a kind of roadmap now for what I'm doing with my own business. And again, it means that the risk is mitigated because I've kind of experienced a little bit firsthand under someone else, with someone else's investment and under someone else's business as an employee with a guaranteed income. Um, and now it's, you know, I'm ready to put my money where my mouth is because I've got that track record there from having worked with someone else. Okay, the gentleman. Uh... He looks like a man with a bit of experience to me. <laughs> What, are, you, are you trying to say I'm old or something? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mark and Philogov, um, two or three things really. You, you said uh, a few things about capital and putting um, capital into the business. What happens if you don't have cash and ha how do you address that? Because not a lot of people will be in a position where they, they're, they're wanting to start something but they don't have cash. You've also said um, get the experience um, and don't go in too early, but a lot of people are, are quite young perhaps and, and have extremely good ideas. I mean, there's some very famous examples there at the moment that have turned into billion dollar companies. And the third thing is that the other extreme of that, I believe there are possibly scales of entrepreneurship. All of you are currently involved in higher turnover things, very successful and all the rest of it, but for some people and, and perhaps many people today, who are starting businesses for a range of reasons, maybe don't have that as a sort of aspiration, or maybe the business that they want to start can be successful for them, in that it will make a living, but it doesn't necessarily reach those 
IPO and multi-million dollar, multi-million pound height. So what would you say about people w w at a smaller scale? A um, couple of good questions there. I mean, I think firstly, when you look at the business idea, the first thing you should do is ask yourself a question. Is this a hobby? Is this a boutique? Or is this a business? Now, I think there's nothing wrong with either one of them other than not knowing. So I think what I've experienced is somebody who runs a boutique, thinks it's a business, has got it wrong. Somebody who comes up with an idea that is not a business but a hobby, but thinks it's a business, is wrong. So if you come up with an idea, and it's a hobby and something you can do in the evenings that makes you money, that gives you an additional income, I think it's absolutely fine as long as you accept that. What makes it a problem is when it's a hobby and you try and turn it into a business, because it doesn't work. I think if you have no cash, then probably you need to work for somebody else and get some cash. Because to start a business on a shoestring with no cash, you know, again, my advice would be, you know, what's the hurry? What is the race? Because I think all you're trying to do is fail quickly. I don't think there's any need to do that. My advice is be patient, be prepared, and do it right. Give yourself every reason to succeed, not every reason to fail. So doing it with nothing, I think, is a little bit of a risk. I think if you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, I, I don't want to build a huge business, I think that's fine. Because at the end of the day, Debbie's business is only in year four, so it's not a lifetime. Faisal's literally in less than one year, and, and Spike's year three. So these are not businesses that essentially are kind of, you know, many, many years old. They're relatively young businesses, but they've taken an idea from scratch, with nothing, with a clean piece of paper, and actually have built significant size businesses. Now, having said that, Debbie's is probably 20 million turnover, um, Faisal is on his second transaction, and Spike is generating how much in funds? Um, 120 million. 120 million in funds into the products that he's creating, but in year three. So the point I'm making is you can do that, but I think if you're gonna be in businesses like that, you have to believe in your own dream because it's nobody <coughs> else's dream, it's your own passion. If you believe you can be big, you have a chance, but if you believe it's a boutique, you won't be generating in the millions. So, you know, I suppose for me on closing, it, it really and truly comes down to you. Businesses are not about great ideas, great business plans, they're about you. It is you who breathe life into the concept it's you who build the business, and it is you who will make it succeed or fail, not the plan. <laughs> Let me ask a burning question myself, and then I would like to ask two or three questions, and get a portfolio of questions, and maybe start by Spike uh, as a response. Okay. Harry, before you start, can I just say, and for those reasons, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Out of what? Yeah, that's awesome question. Of course you are. Um, you, you talked about the business plan uh, earlier, and you said, well, uh, nothing will change uh, compared to what you've formulated your business plan. Uh, you've also said a bit of person, a bit of passion, um, and so on. Uh, students are typically trained to make a business plan. So, can you comment, or any of the others, what is the function, actually, of having a business plan, of making a business plan, and what actually makes a business plan? Or does it just have to be short? Sure. Who would like to take that? Can the spike can I ask uh, you? Yeah, well, first of all, you need to know what your business is. And, and then secondly, you need to know what it does. And then people want to know how it's going to make money. And then they also want to know what can go wrong. And so you need to be there get those four key points in place really. Um, and then obviously once you get on that path and you get on that journey, things do change, the market changes, things take a different course. And you, you need to always know how and when to actually change the action and change the plan. And if you've built a product that's wrong, we did in our first year, you think the market wants it, but for some reason it doesn't. The worst thing you can do is to spend the next three years justifying it and defending it and put all, more and more time in. And what you actually need to do is cut your losses quickly and move on to something else. Any of the others that would like to comment on that? I would just say um, keep it 
relatively concise and you know you can probably use that time trying to find your first customer which would be more useful getting that business up and running and I've seen 50 page plans I've seen 10 page plans I think I get the same information out of the 10 page plan and sometimes even more on the five page one um, I'd say just go out there and get started do your pilot. <coughs> and I would agree with that I mean I think from my perspective my plan was about five pages long, mainly consisting of spreadsheets. And I think in my head, I had the plan from my experience previously, and it was really when I got it onto the spreadsheets and when I got onto paper, then I got very excited because I could see the prospect over a kind of three to five year period. So for me, the plan was more a kind of, of the later stage, actually putting it onto paper. The ideas were all there, the kind of the outputs, etc. But once I got it onto paper for me, it, that wasn't the beginning of the process and not something that I'd learned to do. It was something that kind of consolidated my passion and, 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 and sort of ticked all the boxes to say, yes, I'm going to invest my money and move forward with this. I mean, I do absolutely believe that you need a plan. I don't believe you're ever going to be able to go and raise money or launch a business if you don't have a credible plan. The question is, how long or short should it be and what the content should be? But I don't want to be sitting here diluting the principle or the necessity of the plan because you absolutely do need one. Thank you. What I would like to do now is maybe take about three questions, uh, and I would like to start with Spike. Uh, you can pick the question you like, you can ignore the questions, give some last advice to the audience, whatever you feel like saying as a last show. Uh, and then the last word will be for uh, James. Uh, so can we take um, the lady there uh, at the back? Uh, question? Sorry? You haven't got the question? Okay, well, who is this youngest entrepreneur? Okay, I would love to hear the youngest entrepreneur as well. <laughs> what, what is your age? I'm 12. Have you started your first business already? Or yeah. yeah. What is your business? Car washing. Car washing? Car washing. <laughs> okay. Mine's outside if you want to give it a <laughs> Fantastic. So what is your question? Um, my question is, if you have a small business, how can you turn it into, like, what are your tips for turning it into a larger one? Just wash more cars, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a half question so far. Uh, three more. Uh, the lady at the back. Uh, then actually the lady here. And then for diversity, we actually need a guy. Maybe the guy in the middle. Uh, the start with the lady at the back. Uh, Fred, yeah. Okay, there. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm not a LSC student, I have nothing to do with LSC, but thank you so much. For but you were just in the area that you thought you were talking Yes, and it's a great opportunity, and thank you so much for this. Well, um, because we are, I'm not, and my business partner as well, we are not here um, aware of how to approach uh, James and people like, uh, successful people like James Khan. Um, um, are there any particular ways except filling up Dragon's Den uh, application form or a website how to approach um, Sir Khan and others? If you stand by the exit in about 10, ten minutes time then... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the first question. Second question, the, gen the gentleman uh, over here and then the lady on the uh, Hi James, it's uh, Sandy. I uh, just wanted to ask a question to Fires and James. I think you recently backed a company called Garrington Home Finders. Just wanted to ask um, why did you actually back them um, and a bit more about the model and um, perhaps their exit strategy. Okay. Um, I've just got a question. I'm, I'm looking at developing a business, but it's not um, a service based business, it's a product, which is a consumer product with a sort of technologi technological component to it. So I'm curious to know how you'd go about developing that, seeing as there's all these companies that supposedly offer you lots of help in developing these things, but actually it looks like there's a lot of upfront fees for securing patents, which, as you said, seems a little bit pointless, possibly. So am I better off going to a company and trying to do some sort of partnership arrangement there, or is there some company maybe I haven't heard of that would be more helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much for these questions. We'll start with Spike. Spike can either pick one of the questions, but totally ignore it and, and tell what he wants to share. No, I'll start off with the how to get to scale, because you do need to wash more cars. So the problem is there's only 70 cars that you can wash yourself. But uh, I think, um, you know, what we did, what I did, I set up a, a small financial services company, but then I found a big company that could distribute my, my product. So that company was AXA, and they were the biggest financial services group in the world. 
So even though we were small ourselves, we found a, a very big distributor that could then give us some scale. I think in your case, if I was washing cars, I'd try and find a big employer with a big staff car park. And, uh, and then if you, could, if you could secure a price in so many cars, and then you could then have the security that you can, you can actually supply lots of your mates to go and clean them for them. But, but you need someone that can give you scale. Please pick a question. Please. I'll pick the question that was targeted at at me. On on Garrington, <laughs> it's kind of an obvious one, isn't it? Yeah. Gar Garrington property finders. Um, we backed them because we um, essentially a lot of people had kind of shied away from investing into Garrington because the company had a, kind of a troubled past two years ago, um, but. What people didn't realize was that the guy who founded it, who started spending most of his time in the media, wasn't involved anymore. So we were backing the new, younger generation that had done the management buyout. Um, and we believed in him, so we backed the individual. Uh, the second reason is if you just looked at their database, they had found, <coughs> they had uh, searched for homes for a number of uh, um, private banks and their clients, they were very well networked and plugged in to various referral relationships. And we, we thought that there was latent value in that. We knew that they had a platform that could be scaled, essentially. Debbie? Um, Words of wisdom to close. Gaining, not to close, I think you're closing, <laughs> but to gain investment. Um, I think that's quite an interesting one. For me, it was quite traditional in that, again, I had the experience there, so I was on the sort of on the scene, and I think when I decided to go off my own, I had some contacts that I could use and network through. But I think these days you can be quite creative, and I just remember back sort of a few years now, there was a guy outside Liverpool Street Station with a sandwich board sort of asking for a job, um, who subsequently was hired, but I think he did something quite creative and different. And I think if you're not getting through on the traditional channels of approaching people through the internet or whatever it might be, then I think you need to think maybe a little bit more creatively to get people's attention, um, whatever that kind of method may be. Um, um, I think what I'd like to do on closing is say that for me, picking the journey to become an entrepreneur has probably been the most faceting journey of my life. I think, you know, I started, you know, left school at 16 with no qualifications, with no money, and I think that the journey of being an entrepreneur has really been an incredible, you know, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And, I was recently being interviewed by a journalist who said to me, you know, if I had the choice of, of doing anything in the world I could do, what would I do? And, and I genuinely had to take a step back and reflect. And I said, you know, actually, if I had the choice of doing anything, I'd do what I'm doing today. So I think for me, if this is your passion to be an entrepreneur, then I, I, I couldn't recommend a better profession because I do think uh, it, it's an incredibly and exciting opportunity to be your own boss, to be in control of your own destiny. The only thing I would say on closing is the only way you can do that, there's only one thing you need to do. The, the thing to me that's stopping you from being successful, that the most important ingredient is you have to buy the book. Because in the book... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>